Well, good morning, friends. I'm going to invite you to come on in and find a seat. A little farther. As we get started here, Happy New Year. I feel like I can still say that uh, today since this is our first in-person uh, gathering of 2023. Welcome to worship here at Holland UCC. So glad to have you with us this morning, whether it's your first time here, you've been here a long time, and whether you're here in person at the Civic Center or if you're tuning in from home, we're glad that you're here as well. We are a community that is progressive, engaging, and inclusive where everyone is welcome to the table. We believe that no matter your background or tradition, how you identify, who you love, or where you are on your journey, you are welcome here. Well, today we celebrate Epiphany Sunday, and we remember uh, the visit of the Magi to the child who was born, and we consider, as we look at their journey, what journeys we might be invited into in this year ahead. As you're getting settled into <laughs> our gathering here this morning, we take just a few moments at the beginning of every service just to center ourselves and seek to be present in this moment. So I invite you to get comfortable in your seat, maybe lean back a bit, maybe even close your eyes. And I invite you to take a deep breath in. Breathing in gratitude for this new day and this new year. And breathing out. Breathing in hope, possibility, and peace. And exhale. And as we continue in our mindful breathing, we ring this meditation bowl, which reminds us of the deep peace of God. Jesus, you are light, light that guides us and helps us to know the way, light that encourages us and gives us hope. Help us shine your light in the world. Amen. I invite you to stand if you're able and join us for our opening song, Be Now My Vision. Yeah. 
Peace be with you, friends. And also with you. Feel free to take a moment and offer a word of peace or just a hello to someone who's near you. I invite you to remain standing if you are able and join us in our litany. Litany for the new year. I'll read the regular type together. Let's respond with the bowl. The spirit of life and love, known by many names and yet fully known by none, we give thanks for this new year. We give thanks for the ability to begin again. Grant us the courage to continue on the journey. The courage to speak up for the well-being of others, ourselves, and the planet. May we forgive each other when our courage falls short, and may we try again. Grant us hearts to love boldly, to embody our faith and values in living words and deeds. May our hearts open to embrace humility, grace, and reconciliation. Grant us the ability to learn and grow, to let the spirit of love and truth work its transformation upon us and within us. Grant us the spirit of hospitality, the willingness to sustain a fit dwelling place for the holy that resides in all being. Grant us a sense of being at peace in the world, even as we are in motion. Let us cultivate together the strength to welcome every kind of gift and in all manner of ways to be on the journey together. Amen. And may it be so. You may be seated. Our verse for reflection this morning from Psalm 72, 18. Blessed be the Beloved the one who dwells in open hearts, who guides us along the way. Our poem this morning comes to us from Jan Richardson, an epiphany-inspired poem for those who have far to travel. If you could see the journey whole, you might never undertake it might never dare the first step that propels you from the place you have known to the place you know not. Call it one of the mercies of the road that we see it only by stages as it opens before us, as it comes into our keeping, step by single step. There is nothing for it but to go, and by our going to take the vows the pilgrim takes to be faithful to the next step, to rely on more than the map, to heed the signposts of intuition and dreams, to follow the star that only you will recognize, to keep an open eye for the wonders that attend the path, to press on beyond distractions, beyond fatigue, beyond what would tempt you from the way. There are vows that only you will know, the secret promises for your particular path, and the new ones you will need to make when the road is revealed by turns you could not have foreseen. Keep them, break them, 
make them again. Each promise becomes part of the path. Each choice creates the road that will take you to the place where at last you will kneel to offer the gift most needed, the gift that only you can give before turning to go home by another way. For those who have far to travel, by Jan Richardson. Well, at this time, I'll invite our kindergartners through fifth graders to join our UCC Kids Time and follow our leaders, Krista and Sydney. You'll be just down the hall in the bleacher area for a time of lesson, story, and craft. Today's lesson in, is about sharing, entitled A Basket Full of Love. <clears throat> As they're going, I'll invite our reader forward. Words of Integration and Guidance by Wes Cranberg Michelson. We tend to think of pilgrimages as journeys to a specific destination, but as much as they might be about place, they're equally about what the pilgrim leaves behind, propelled by an inward journey. Perhaps because it lacks any grand strategy or compelling plan, there is a spiritual compulsion so inexplicable to modern rationalistic understanding to embark on pilgrimage. You set out. You begin to walk or sail or drive, taking what you can for an unknown timeline and leaving all the rest behind. That's how pilgrimages usually start. You're feeling dissatisfied, anxious, depleted, desperate, or just deeply discontented. In such a moment, you know that your present circumstances of life are simply not working. There's a longing for something more, something different, something deeper. But you're not sure what this is. Asked to describe what you're seeking by your friend or therapist, your answers are vague and tentative. This yearning comes more at the intuitive level. You have discovered an inner thirst that can be quenched by the outward circumstances of your life. Usually it requires this, a decision to step out of the accustomed and superficially comfortable normalcy of your present reality and leave it behind. A reading of scripture from Isaiah 60. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For darkness shall cover the earth, the thick darkness of peoples, but the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will appear over you. Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look around. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons shall come from far away, and your daughters shall be carried on their nurses' arms. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and rejoice, because the abundance of the sea shall be brought to you, the wealth of nations shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall cover you. I'll let Brian explain that one. <laughs> the young camels of Midian and Ephah, all those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense and shall proclaim the praise of the Lord. All the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered to you. The rams of Nebaioth shall minister to you. They shall be acceptable on my altar and I will glorify my house. Who are these that fly like a cloud? and like doves to their windows. For the coastlands shall wait for me, the ships of Tarshish first, to bring your children from far away, their silver and gold with them, for the name of the Lord your God and for the Holy One of Israel, because he has glorified you. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Thank you, James. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew chapter 2, Matthew 2, 1 through 12. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all Jerusalem with him. 
And calling together all of the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, so that I also may go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. So you might hear our gospel reading this morning and think, wise men, was it Christmas like two weeks ago? And you're right, it was actually exactly two weeks ago uh, was Christmas Day. But we often forget that the Christmas season or Christmas tide actually starts with Christmas Day and goes through January 6th or Epiphany. For many of us in our consciousness in our Western culture, Christmas begins when we start hearing Christmas music, right, the day after Thanksgiving, hopefully not sooner. <laughs> Epiphany is a Christian feast day that celebrates the revelation or manifestation of God incarnate in the Christ child, and has traditionally been celebrated, again, January 6th, which was uh, this past Friday, or the first Sunday after January 1. It's also known as Three Kings Day, Theophany, or Little Christmas. It also marks the end of the 12 days of Christmas, which means that if you still had your tree up this past week, you were just being very liturgical. Good for you. Now if you have it up by next Sunday, you're on your own. You do you, that's okay. Well, this story of the visit of the Magi in Matthew chapter 2 is one of my favorite texts, one of my favorite stories in the gospel, because there's so many rich themes, right? We've got travel, we've got secrecy, we've got uh, a villain, there's dreams, the changing of plans. I mean, this really has so much. But given that we're at the start of a new year, I really want to focus on the journey aspect of the text, the journey of these wise men, as we consider our own journeys for what lies ahead. And so here we have a group of pagan astrologers who left familiar territory in order to find something new. It wouldn't be wrong in a way to say that they set off on pilgrimage. And as our words of integration and guidance reminded us, uh, we tend to think of pilgrimage as going to a certain place like Santiago de Compostela or Jerusalem or Rome or somewhere like that. But there's also the inward journey, the pilgrimage of the heart. And many of us have experienced such a journey, no doubt are already in the midst of one. And each of us, of course, have our unique stories, and all of our stories have a certain origin or starting point. For many of us, that story began in a setting that placed a high value on the religious life. Perhaps our parents took us to church every week, maybe even twice on Sunday. <laughs> wow. We learned certain religious teachings, in my case, uh, a work called the Heidelberg Catechism was a big uh, focus of our 
religious instruction, which I was dismayed to learn at one point wasn't actually written in the Netherlands. It was written in Germany in 1563. In many ways, uh, a beautiful document for its time and place. But we were told this is the truth for all time. And we were told the answers have already been discovered. Your job is to memorize them. Something like that sound familiar to anyone? Maybe. We all have our unique stories. But for too many of us, we were handed not only the answers, but we were told, here are the questions that can be asked. <laughs> right? Other questions, not allowed. And in my own setting, we were expected at some point in our path to do what we called uh, make a profession of faith. And that involved going before the elders of the church and making sure that they knew, that we knew, that we had all the correct answers and had the right doctrine memorized. And then we stand before the church and offer up the same. At least this was how I experienced it. Others may have other experiences. And in the way I experienced, the goal of this really wasn't to learn about anyone's authentic spiritual journey. The goal was to make sure that we had created a replica of ourselves who would tow the correct theological line, continue to show up every Sunday, and not rock the boat. And in many ways it was seen as a culmination of your spiritual process, not the beginning. Well, I was a senior in high school, and I still hadn't done this. And so that raised some concern, some worry. What's wrong with Brian? Why hasn't he made a profession of faith yet? Is he having doubts? Is he really one of us? Now, those questions came later. <laughs> but the last thing anyone wanted was a student to go off from high school to college without having made a profession of faith, because then you were going to be your soul might be in danger once you started hearing what your liberal professors <laughs> had to say. And so I finally uh, agreed to do it. And the process started with the pastor coming over to my house. And I've been doing some reading. Uh, I read some of the other uh, documents that were a part of our tradition, reading some of the fine print, and became increasingly alarmed and uncomfortable with what I was Reading and one of the explicit doctrines that I was expected to sign on to was that not only had God predestined and chosen who was going to be in heaven forever before they ever existed, that was hard enough. Those were the elect. But God had also chosen before they were born who was going to be eternally damned in hell forever. It had all been determined for all of us before we ever showed up. And unfortunately, the group that was going to the bad place was much larger. The vast majority, frankly, of humans who had ever lived. And so, the pastor and I sat at our dining room table and I kind of explained some of what I was reading and I said, is this right? This seems pretty awful. And the pastor said, now Brian, you have to remember that it's all God's grace. We all deserve hell and the fact that any of us aren't going to go there is because of God's love and graciousness. Isn't that beautiful, he said. Don't we serve a great God? And I thought, well... <laughs> but for the sake of keeping the peace and not making too many waves, I said something like, okay, and went forward with the process. Now, ironically, it was later at the uh, denominationally appropriate seminary where I had learned more of the history and the context where these doctrines were initially created and written down, 
and was really given the tools to deconstruct the things that I was expected to continue to uphold as a pastor. And that honestly helped kickstart my journey, my spiritual journey, in earnest. That and the ability to learn it was okay to ask literally any question. But that was okay. And I began to do that in pub theology gatherings with people from different religions and backgrounds than my own, some from different strands of the wider Christian tradition, uh, and beyond, right? And some of these folks were, were Buddhist, Muslim, Jewish, humanist, some who didn't believe in God at all. But these folks, as we were in conversation together, were in a way like magi to me, offering gifts from their tradition that helped me stretch and learn and grow. And I really don't want to throw my upbringing under the bus because I was raised in a loving home and given a solid foundation from which to begin my journey. But it had to become my journey. It had to become my journey. And that what was key for me in that process was that I had to learn to trust myself. <laughs> Many of us were raised to distrust ourselves <coughs> if we had questions. Do you think you know more than the Bible? Do you think you know more than God? Obviously you're wrong, so don't even ask the question. Your job isn't to understand it, it's just to believe it. I honestly can't think of a less healthy spiritual approach. Right? It borders on spiritual abuse, frankly. And the very idea of epiphany is that it's a discovery that you have to make and that no one can make for you. Epiphany focuses on the journey from the known to the unknown. And who are our models for this journey? Pagan astrologers, outsiders, right? People had nothing to do with Judaism or Christianity, which didn't even exist yet. But they leaned into trusting their own inner knowing to guide them forward with only a mysterious light to guide them. And when they reached the end of the, their journey, it wasn't as if they suddenly converted into being evangelical Christians. <laughs> right? They were still <clears throat> pagans. But ones who had had a transformative encounter with the child Jesus. And they found that child by trusting and listening to what was within them. Stephen Charleston, an elder with the Choctaw Nation, writes, I believe in a power greater than any of us can comprehend. My ancestors called the spirit Hashtali, the vastness beyond the sun. And that is exactly what the spirit is, a vast consciousness present in creation at all times and in all places and equally present in each of our lives. And then he says, I believe the spirit speaks to all of us and it is important that we listen to her. And then he says this, do not doubt yourself, especially if you were programmed to do so by the critique of others. Claim the wisdom that is uniquely yours. <clears throat> do not doubt yourself. And I think many of us need to hear that, be given that permission. Because too many of us have been programmed to doubt ourselves. 
And once you, like the wise ones of old, step off the map, there will be critics. Right? There will be powerful Herod-like figures who have their own plans for you that are not in your best interest. When I left my previous denomination for the UCC, I was told that my kids were going to hell. I was told that I was a heretic and was doing Satan's work. When you take the path less traveled, there will always be those who are afraid. Because you're walking into a territory that they've been told is off limits. But once you realize that those supposed limits are all human-made constructions, right? you are free. Free to explore, free to ask questions, free to walk your own journey. And free even to return to former beliefs that perhaps now you hold in a new and different way. And you being free can frankly feel like a threat to someone else who's held captive in a prison. A prison that's sometimes called orthodoxy or the one true path or simply church. Ruth Haley Barton asks, so what might we learn from walking in the shoes of those who left familiar territories to follow a mysterious star? How is our own journey mirrored in the journey those seekers of old took? And I think that answer is somewhat unique to each and every one of us. But the invitation for us is to embark on the journey even when the road ahead isn't clear. And along the way, we'll discover that real insight or enlightenment is sometimes found in the most unexpected places. We'll discover that we need to perhaps ignore or even disobey the powers that be in order to respond to something truer. We might learn that our bodies have a wisdom of their own guiding us when we should take this path instead of that one. And we might come again to the Christ child and drop to our knees in wonder as if discovering him again for the very first time. Because such an encounter has the power to change our lives so much so that we too might have to return home again by a different route. A route that we as a community of pilgrims, a community of searchers and seekers, make by putting one foot in front of the other, a path that doesn't yet exist, a road that we make by walking it. Because in the end, the spiritual life is much more about the journey than the destination. <clears throat> Amen. 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 Maybe so. I invite you to stand if you're able and join us in our song of response. We Three Kings.
Christy, you may be seated. We have an opportunity to give uh, an offering this morning, and just a reminder that our work is supported solely by the generosity of our friends and members like each of you, and here we are at the beginning of a new year, and as we look to the good work we want to continue and even expand, we need your help to do that, and we're looking, as many of you know, for a new space to meet because this building's not going to be available come uh, March uh, to us, and so to help us afford to find a space that really suits our community, helps us lean into the next phase of our life together, we need your support to make that happen. So if you'd like to give an offering this morning, there's a box in the back. You can offer your gift there uh, before you leave, or if you'd like to give online, you can do that on our website, hollanducc.org slash donate. And as always, out of God's generosity, we give, asking that God would use these gifts and us to turn our world upside down with love. We have time now to share some things that are happening in our lives and in our world that we would like to have remembered in prayer or maybe something we'd like to celebrate. Folks tuning in from home, feel free to share in the comments. And if you're here, you can raise your hand and I'll bring the microphone around. Hi. 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 My name is Clay. This is my wife, Sherry. Um, this is our first time here. Uh, we, we attended online last week and it was lovely. And I just wanted to say what a joy it was or has been to be here with all of you. It is one of the most, one of the warmest and I think most welcoming environments that I've ever, ever been in. So, oh, um, it's an absolute treat. Thank you. Awesome. Well, welcome, Clint and Sherry. So glad to have you with us this morning. And for new friends, we say thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Yeah. First for the Wesson Doors. Yeah, absolutely. Jeff and Nancy have headed off to Guatemala with a team of folks who are doing uh, some good work building some homes uh, with. Uh, some Guatemalan partners and uh, doing some other uh, community building activities so prayers for safe travel for them and uh, for the goodness that they will both bring and create and receive in their time there so for Jeff and Nancy and their wider team we say oh God hear our prayers, prayers. good morning I um, wanted to lift up a couple people in prayer. One is Randy Slot, and Randy and Jan are friends of, of Holland UCC. We know them from Grand Rapids. Randy had heart surgery. He's doing pretty well, but just continued prayers for his healing. Also, Ted Scans, Ted and Kristen, who attend Holland, uh, they're in Ann Arbor right now coming back. Ted's brother had heart aneurysm surgery, and so continued prayers for John. And then lastly, the, the tragedy in Virginia, the six-year-old who um, had a gun and shot his teacher. I don't know if you've heard about that, but man, it doesn't get more tragic for all of them and just how awful guns are. So sharing that with all of you. She's recovering well. She's the teacher's recovering well. well. Yeah. Oh, oh, good. Yeah. So glad to hear it. <laughs> Well, we'll certainly keep uh, Randy in prayers for his recovery, uh, for the Scances and, and their family, and certainly for uh, this tragedy in Virginia, which we know is reflective of uh, an ongoing epidemic of, of gun violence in this country. Uh, we pray for that community, for that teacher and her healing. And we lift this all up to God and say, oh God, hear our prayers. Other things, yeah. So I work in a school that serves kids who have multiple medical issues and um, cognitive impairment. And since we broke for Christmas break, um, we've had two of our students pass away. They weren't in our room, but they were quite young in the program. Um, our school serves kids five to 26. So I mean, special ed is a, a different situation than Jen ed. Um, but with the medical complexities our kids have, we kind of don't anticipate problems, but the things that these 
these students passed away from were not expected. They were um, just really random things. So just a prayer for their families as they're navigating grief and a completely different path for their families. But also prayers for the, the teachers and the support staff and all the people who are in and out of the classrooms and, and get to know these kids like they're their own children. Um, and just hug all your people tighter. You, know, you never really know. Thank you, Crystal. Thanks for your good work and holding your community and these families uh, who are grieving in our hearts. And we lift them up to God and say, oh God, hear our prayers. Hi, um, I'm sure I'm not the only one that's been following the local news about what's going on in the commissioner's office. <laughs> And I, I guess I just want to lift up prayers to, for our voices to be heard and for things to go okay. I'm kind of freaked out about it, but you know, just, <laughs> yeah, prayers. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Elise, for those who perhaps didn't notice or weren't on social media this week, uh, the Ottawa County Commissioners, uh, newly elected, had their first meeting and pulled some moves that seemed uh, unhealthy and, and unhelpful for local County governance. And so prayers for wisdom, for how to go forward, and how to have our democratic voices heard. Uh, so thanks for mentioning that. Uh, I also want to mention um, a family, uh, Afghan refugee family, that was brought to some of our attention um, that Lighthouse Immigrant Advocates here in Holland has been working with. Uh, they have been staying with some of their family who I think had been settled uh, here in West Michigan sooner, but had been kicked out. Uh, for whatever reason, uh, I think on Christmas Eve, and Lighthouse has been helping put them up in a hotel, but is kind of reaching the end of the funds that they have in order to do that. And so I'm, I'm offering this both as a prayer and an opportunity for action. So if you would like to contribute a monetary amount to help them uh, even extend their temporary stay, or if you know of a space where they could find lodging uh, longer term, uh, Please talk to me and I can get you in touch with our friends at Lighthouse. So thinking of what uh, was mentioned for the local governance and thinking of this family and we lift that up to God and say, <coughs> oh God, yes. Anything coming through online? No, okay. Anybody else? Well, we know there's much more happening in each of our lives and in our world than we've given voice to now. And so for whatever else you might be holding on to, I invite you to lift that up to God <coughs> in the silence. Let you stand if you're able and join us as we sing our closing doxology together. Come thou from whom all blessings flow, wake us to see more than we know. Help us claim all our gifts and
but you stick around after the service, grab a cup of coffee, get to know somebody new. If it's your first time with us, we do have some uh, welcome cards on the back table. Please feel free to fill one out and drop it in the offering box so we can uh, stay connected. Also, we have some sign-ups in the back if you'd like to volunteer to help uh, show up early for setup, if you'd like to be a greeter, a reader, or help with music, uh, we'd love for your help uh, as we continue uh, to be community together. Reminder that after worship, uh, if you'd like to have your photo taken for the digital directory, uh, Christy will be downstairs in the lobby, uh, so see her before you go if you'd like to have your photo taken, and if you don't like how it turns out, you know, we don't have to use it, but, uh, but it will be a picture of you, so I don't know why I said that. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's terrible. Scratch that. Scratch that. <laughs> yes. Our community meal that we are serving this Wednesday, uh, happening 5.30 at First United Methodist Church. Is there anything still needed, Joan? <coughs> We need another crock pot of soup, another cake. I believe we have enough servers who are going to serve the meal. So if you'd like to provide some soup, see uh, Joan Williams after the service uh, and let her know. And thanks to all who are contributing food and serving it. Uh, Wednesday, Pup Theology, 630 Grace Episcopal Church. Bring your own beverage. Uh, join for open conversation on life and faith. And if you just want to hang out and have some free time, get to know some new folks, Thursday mornings. You can show up to the Hayworth Hotel in the lobby there at the Big B Coffee. Any other announcements for the good of the whole? You can always go online, follow us on social media or our website, hollanducc.org, for the latest. And now, as you go, wherever your journey takes you in this year ahead, may you trust the spirit within you to lead and to guide to give you peace. Amen. Amen. Go in peace.